of Ohio and Kent W. Clapp, Endowed Chair and Professor of Nursing at the Francis Payne Boston Bolton School of Nursing. Her career spans over 50 years, and the impact of her research and scholarship extends well beyond the field of nursing. The Francis Payne Bolton School of Nursing Dean, Carol Musel, called Professor Gary a trailblazer and an innovative and productive scholar. Dr. Gary wants you to know that she grew up in the rural south and education was limited due to segregation. She went to Florida A&M University where yes. black students <laughs> could only be with black students and faculty and black patients. She could not interact with a white patient until she graduated when she went to Syracuse and then later got her master's degree in Chicago from St. Xavier and she was the only black student on campus. From there, she worked in San Francisco Ch Chinatown, North Beach, as a community health nurse coordinator. She was not able to be employed for a year due to the fact that she was a colored nurse. But she did end up going back to her home, Tallahassee, Florida, to work at a TB hospital. And at the age of 28, she received her doctorate at the University of Florida. Okay. So, Dr. Gary has authored over a hundred publications in scientific journals, textbooks, chapters, and monographs. Her contributions have informed health policy related to child and adolescent mental health, health disparities, and domestic violence. She's received more than 30 honors from national and international organizations. And in 2018, she received the Melva Jo Hendricks Lectureship Award from the International Society of Psychiatric Mental Health Nurses. And the award recognized her commitment to improving care for the underserved, stigmatized, or disenfranchised persons living with mental illness. She is also the visionary behind the university's Provo Scholars Program, which she established in 2013 with the support of former provost Bud Baselak. The groundbreaking program has positively impacted more than 100 students from East Cleveland schools. The students receive mentoring and tutoring from the university faculty, staff, and students that prepares them to be successful undergrads. So the other important information that we should know is that she was part of founding this program and it's not lost on me that we're all here today because of her bravery, her courage, the fact that she was part of integrating schools is not lost on me, that my parents could come and you guys know I cry, but <laughs> I'm really good at it, um, that they could come over in the 1970s to Oregon where just recently they got rid of sundown, sundowning. Um, it's not lost on me that people like this are why we're here today. So please, please, please give a warm welcome to Dr. Perry. Thank you. Thank you. I can't forget to mention that she also published a book that's up on the screen, A Population Health Approach to Health Disparities for Nurses, and that we each get to have one of these books when we leave. So that's oh, and, sorry. <laughs> and um, she is willing to sign the book at breakfast tomorrow. She's leaving tomorrow, so make sure if you want your book signed that you come meet with her tomorrow morning at breakfast. Thank you. Thank you. Well, my name is Faye Gary, and my family and people back home in Ocala, Florida, call me a country bumpkin. <laughs> and one that would never, never disavow rural black America. And that's just about the truth. Um, because rural black America saved me, nurtured me, and taught me, even though we had nothing. 
But we did have cows and pigs and turkeys and geese and corn and potatoes, and we shared with everyone. But the common message was, child, things will get better. This cannot last. And I had the audacity to believe it. And it happened. I would like to acknowledge Ms. Janet Jackson that I met in a hotel lobby some 15, 18 years ago. And uh, we talked about how we could enhance, expand, savor, and secure the Minority Fellowship Program. And that has happened. So I'd like to acknowledge her and to say that she has put her lifeblood in this program. So thank you. I hope Dr. Outlaw is in the room because I've been knowing her since she was a fellow. <laughs> and I was on the advisory board. And that's when I met, uh, I met Dr. Outlaw. And I also would like to acknowledge two wonderful fellows who are matriculating at Case Western Reserve University. I am the advisor for one, and on the other young lady, I serve on her dissertation committee, and they make you proud. Mm -hmm. And I'm so happy to serve in that capacity. Would you stand up? Yeah, <laughs> We've had numerous excellent students from Case Western Reserve University, which characterizes itself as one of the world's best and first class universities, and we collaborate uh, with Cleveland Clinic as well. Now, the other person that I would like to acknowledge is the person I've known the longest, and that's Dr. Jose Nuronde. Dr. Nuronde, yeah. where? Yeah. Are you stand up, Dr. Nuronde? You need to stand up. Now, let me tell you something about Dr. Nuronde. I call Dr. Yaronde Saint. I don't refer to him as Dr. Yaronde. Now, let me tell you why. I have seen Dr. Yaronde at the University of Florida and at Wayne State. He came to help us start our doctoral program at the University of Florida. I have seen Dr. Yaronde come to his office on Sundays. I remember he came on Super Bowl Sunday to help a black woman finish her dissertation and graduate. So he has... For me, he has deserved the uh, nomenclature of saint, mm. and I refer to him as saint, mm. because he will do anything to help you. Mm. Now I'm going to talk about you. I want to congratulate you. Oh, is Don in the room? I saw Dr. Downs in the room. Mm. Dr. Downs? Oh. <laughs> now, when I was the program director, Dr. Downs and I had conversations in the corner in the back about what her dissertation would be about. And now I'm reading about her obits in the New York Times. And by the way, New York Times has never called me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm very proud of her. I'm proud of her. So today, I've also written a, a textbook some years ago, 1,050 pages, called Psychiatric Mental Health Nursing, was published by Lippincott some years ago. So this is my second uh, edited text. This was more uh, about health disparities. The other was strictly about psychiatric nursing following the DSM-3R at the time. So you know it's an old book, but it's still available. And uh, I got a commentary from... Uh, Harvard University School of uh, Department of Psychiatry, that the uh, vignettes in the book are excellent. Uh, but it's an old book now when we move on. However, uh, disparities still exist. So even though we have move on, and I'd like to thank you for investing your time and your energy to improve the human condition. I know of no illness that's more devastating than mental illness. There is none. If you can think about it, raise your hand and let me know. It's a devastating illness that interrupts people's lives, families, communities, and costs nations billions of dollars. And yet, we never cure it. And in my opinion, we don't do a good job with managing it. 
not yet, but you will help to make the difference over time. So I'm very proud to be with you because you represent the future. You represent people who will make a difference wherever you are. Wherever you are, do the best that you can. You heard her say for one year, I was unemployed. And let me tell you the story. I was living at home on, we have a farm. I work with my daddy in the field, feeding the cows and the hogs and fixing the fence because my family refused to let me do domestic work. So I worked in the field. And you remember that's where the majority of the slaves were. They worked in the fields. They didn't work in the house. So I worked in the fields. And one Sunday night I went to bed and I got a phone call from the University of Florida, one of the administrators. She said, are you Faye Gary? I said, yes, I am. I had been there a year before the interview. And they said, could you come to work tomorrow? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, what time would you like me to be there? <laughs> they said, no, I would be fine. I said, well, shall I come? And they told me, and I got in my little raggedy car, and I went to the University of Florida, and that began my tenure as a faculty member. I worked one year. I said, nope, I'm not ready to be here. I went and got my doctorate came back and chaired the psychiatric nursing department for about 15 or more years in charge of a program that I could not attend. Mm. I went on the Greyhound bus from Ocala, Florida to Chicago, Illinois. That's how I got to Chicago. And a woman who took in washing and ironing gave me some fried chicken, some peanut butter uh, and jelly, a mason jar filled with water, and put it in a shoebox and say, God be with you, persevere. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. So I'm telling you that being in a hotel, and Miss Janet Jackson fixed this pretty stage for your graduation, to be grateful. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to focus on this book. Uh, it'll take a long time, but I'm going to try and be brief. I had to make notes for myself, otherwise you'd be here till uh, after graduation. <laughs> <laughs> so the book is edited by uh, Faye Gary and Marilyn Lotus, who is retired, but she was an associate dean uh, at Case Western Reserve University. Now this book has PowerPoints for every chapter. So if you're teaching and you want to use the book, I've done your homework for you. <laughs> the book also has a manual. Now let me tell you a little story. I didn't know we had to do the manual and the PowerPoints until after I finished the book. <laughs> and the editor said, we need some PowerPoints and a manual. So the manual, I finished the last part of the manual, chapter 25. We had to do this. Lotus and Gary did the PowerPoints and the manual. The manuals are very well done. The last one I did was uh, chapter 25, had something like 30 pages, it's almost a chapter in itself. But what we were trying to do is to give individuals information that they need. And to give inf people information that they perhaps would not want to hear. Mm -hmm. But we have to tell the truth and diagnose the problem if we're going to fix the issue. That's what we get taught every day. But when it comes to other issues in our lives, we deny, we imposter. We talked about that as well. We become imposters. We become who we are not, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but now you have these tools in front of you, and you can use them as you wish. And I hope you critique them and write and tell me everything I missed and <laughs> what I should do right. <laughs> and I would be very grateful to you for that. Uh, the first chapter is uh, written by uh, Faye Gary, David Satcher, the Honorable David Satcher, who was a uh, Surgeon General, who's now at uh, the Mohawk School of Medicine, and Dr. Okafar. Mm -hmm. I'd like to also say that we spent a week uh, in um, Atlanta with Ms. Janice Jackson. Uh, Don, were you there? Okay. And Dr. Yarande and others who were fellows. And we were at Morehouse, we were just every place. And it was a wonderful, uh, and Dr. Satcher spent a lot of good time with us. Uh, and so I called him up and said, are you ready to do a chapter? And he said, yes, let's get moving. So in this first chapter in the book, 
uh, we talk about a social context uh, and we wanted to look at uh, the dynamics of four domains in this social context that we call uh, this uh, sociological, sociobiological perspective uh, that we can use uh, to, to uh, discuss. Now, this is a, a model that also comes from Bon uh, Van Breno out of uh, Harvard as well. This is a, this comes from CDC and it's also found in the World Health Organization. So it has a lot of utility and I like it because it talks about the individual or it discusses the individual. It discusses relationships. It discusses community and society. And whatever you're doing, you can lay your work out in this kind of format. Because there's always an individual. But then you have societal laws, you have public policy, you have counterpoints, you have points, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You have communities that you're trying to engage, you have families that you're trying to convince that the child needs help, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So this social ecological model is one that uh, I decided that I would have it's his first chapter uh, with Dr. Satcher's uh, collaboration. Uh, the other part of this uh, first chapter uh, is related to the future of how health care will be delivered. You all know this, so bear with me. But when we talk about an upstream and a downstream approach to health care, and believe it or not, I wrote about this in our textbook that's 20 years old. I wrote about this concept. Let me tell you what I put in the other book because you can read this. I said, suppose you see a person coming downstream, drowning, and you jump in, you resuscitate the person, and you put them aside, and they are okay. Not perfect, but okay. And you get your breath. And by the time you get your breath, you look up, and here's another person coming downstream. And they're out of breath, and they're about to drown. So you jump in, and you save them. This goes on and on and on. And at the, the last part of the paragraph in the former book is, why don't you go upstream yeah. and see who in the world is throwing them in? <laughs> That's prevention. Yeah. That's upstream healthcare. So they, this is not necessarily fancy. It's just basic common sense. Go up and see who's throwing people in the stream and why are they drowning. In other words, why so much mortality and morbidity? And why in your community? And why in my community? And why, and it's the same in Florida where I just came from my home in Ocala. Mm. In rural America, people are dying. And I'm going back to Case Western tomorrow. And in urban communities, people are dying. And they're dying basically for the same reason. Cancer, stroke, heart disease, no transportation, no advocacy, no doula, no insurance. Same thing. Different environment, but the same thing. And so when we talk about upstream approach, what I have here, then if it's upstream, we're going to be looking at prevention, health promotion, disease prevention, prompt treatment, and rehabilitation. Long time ago, a man by the name of Kaplan at Harvard talked about prevention, he had these same concepts. That was in the 1960s. What happens is a lack of will and policy and implementation and evaluation to address these issues. But you can do it in your dissertations, in your op-eds like Dr. Downs, in your clinical practice when you get on these boards that we heard about this morning. You talk about it. We cannot afford to continue a downstream approach in medicine. It costs us billions of dollars. And if you have a mental illness, especially schizophrenia, the literature says that you will probably die 25 years earlier mm -hmm. than your will counterpart. Mm -hmm. Now, hallucinations don't necessarily kill you, so I leave the critical thinking to you. Why do you think they die? 
And why do you think we let them lie out on the streets and hallucinate? I use the, uh, throughout our book, we talk about, I've skipped over now to chapter five. Throughout, and Dr. Yarande and I wrote chapter five. Um, Dr. Yarande and I have been collaborating for years and years, and if you look at my CV, a lot of uh, the publications are with him, and I must confess, if he did not help me, a lot of them would not have gotten published. So he really can made a significant difference, and I thank him. But in this model, it's not complex. It can be used all over the world. The World Health Organization, CDC, our book, your book, your dissertation, I've heard you all say it. This is, I don't know if I have a pointer on this. Is there a pointer here? No, no pointer. Okay, but I can point. <laughs> um, for me, this is built communities. You build communities with nice houses, with lawns, backyards, sidewalks. And this is the social context. That is, how is it that people get along? And if you don't, you can settle arguments through dialogue and not guns. You can have jobs so they're not these cottage industries that uh, flare up where people are selling drugs and doing all the illicit things that are not good for health. Economic stability is when you're satisfied, you have a decent job, you have some continuity of who you are yourself in your employment. But for me, I think the two that are most important are education access and quality and health care access and quality. When I was talking with Ms. Jackson a few days ago, I said, what do you think about that? Do you agree? And she said, yes. I'm talking about Janet Jackson, and she's not a nurse. She immediately agreed that if we can improve education, I work with the Provost Scholars. It's the poorest community in the United States, East Cleveland. There are brilliant children there. What's missing is opportunity. So when you see a poor person, and one who you think is not, not uh, necessarily productive, I want you to think about one thing. You have to look at opportunity. See, you have opportunity. I have opportunity. The difference between us and them and those and they is opportunity. So with the Provost Scholars, we give them opportunity if they finish our program and they get admitted to case, they come for free. And that's about $350,000 for undergraduate education at Case Western. They come for free. And yet, in the school system, on any given day, the absenteeism rate is about 40%. Now you go back to the model. We need to do some work with individuals and families. Okay? We need to do some work with society, changing the curriculum. You can change the curriculum, but if people don't come, they don't know you changed it. So we have to look at all of these layers. So here, I think this is very important, but unless we can provide a quality education and quality health care, and then our next one is we talk about uh, health literacy, you're not going to get <coughs> good health care and health literacy and health numeracy, and that's the numbers, unless people know how to read and write and understand the importance of their own being and the importance of health care for them and their families. And so how do you do that? You have to address the inequities that exist. You have to challenge the inequities, people with power, money, privilege, and resources. That might be your dean. That might be the university president, it might be the mayor. That might be the minister, the senior minister at your church. Wherever you are, you make a challenge. And of course, you collect the data, evaluate it, make a case for how and why things should change. So I like this model. This model is embedded in Healthy People 2030 and Healthy People 2020 and perhaps the others too. Healthy People 2030, Healthy People 2010, 2000. Look at 
the outcomes. Mm -hmm. Mental health has less positive outcomes than do the others about cancer or about heart disease, et cetera, et cetera. Mental health is stigmatized and bastardized. Mm -hmm. And we have to make the difference. Now, part of the other part of epidemiology, I've developed this to give a good visual about what happens if we do not address the health disparities. Economic stability is essential for purchasing health care, good health, uh, not living next to a toxic dump that the city has given permission to be there. See, these things just don't happen. They happen by law, policy, attitude. And people breathe the air that's detrimental to their health. Education, because you can't make an argument about why this is not good for me and my family. Healthcare access, because you have no money, you have no transportation, you cannot afford to go to the doctor, you have to wait until you're very sick and pain dictates that you will go. Neighborhoods and built communities where people can be safe with recreation, etc., etc., social community context where there are support systems and people are free. Now what will happen over time is that all of these issues are leaking out. The water is leaking out and the fish is barely holding on. And if somebody doesn't come and fix up this leak, well, my goodness, the fish food is nobody's there to even feed the fish. So that's my conceptualization of what will happen to vulnerable people unless we have a shift in the paradigm. Now, who do I call vulnerable? I say all of us are vulnerable. It just depends on the circumstance you find yourself at the moment. When I go for treatment, I'm vulnerable. When you in horizontal orbit on a gurney, go into an operating room, you might have been the dean yesterday, but right now you're in a very vulnerable position. So vulnerability varies according to your current, present state. And you're vulnerable when you don't even know it. That's how I feel when I'm flying on an airplane. I'm saying I'm vulnerable and I don't even know what to be worried about. <laughs> but I feel quite vulnerable. So let's move on now. I talked about uh, the chapter that Dr. Rondi and I did on uh, epidemiology. So let's move on now to health literacy. This chapter was written by Dr. Rood, who is at Harvard University and who teaches uh, in the School of uh, Medicine. Now, in this particular slide, I talk about how many people have strong health literacy skills. And in the United States, it's less than 20%. And that's including nurses and doctors, and we should. About 30% have low skills, and the rest have almost no skills. Numbers are important to help people stay alive and to make decisions. Skills are when we talk with patients, we need to avoid jargon, provide visuals, sketch it out on a piece of paper, ask them to sketch it out on a piece of paper, discuss it with them, do the math with the patient, and then ask the patient to return the process just don't think that you say this is the way you do your insulin, that they understand. Check it out. These are people's lives. The insulin might mean the difference between their quality of life or maybe their longevity, who knows? You need to s explain the context. You can compare. You can compare, compare how you feel before, how you feel after, compare the clinical test, but give them some context, and comparison is very, very helpful. Many times I ask my patient to role play. Tell me how you're going to do this. Tell me how you're going to manage your child when you get home. And we'll do a little role play. I learned that parents love to do that. Patients love to do that. Thank you. That's a way of showing your empathy, your care. 
an extension to what you want them to do when they get home. So I put this here. Of all of the slides out the book, I chose this one about health literacy because I think it's important. Now let's move on to chapter 10. And this is mental health as a base of all health. And this chapter is written by Gary and Bussing, and Bussing is the chair of the Department of Psychiatry at the University of Florida. She and I have collaborated for some 40 years. Uh, the interconnection of general health and mental health is of extreme importance. And in our practice, we're just getting to the point where we rep you all have been using the word intersectionality. It's a nice new word. But they just got to connect, OK? <laughs> <laughs> they just got to connect. And you have to know they're connected. And you have to do something about it. See, you can have intersectionality. And that's all. Nothing happens. But you have to be empathetic enough to know to do the other part of it and make something happen and get rid of all of this health disparity that we've experienced ever since statistics were taken and even before that. So what do we say? Something very simple from this chapter. Health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. Infirmity was uh, added lately. This comes from the World Health Organization. And we try to get a definition, a general definition that we use with our patients. Mental health is a state of physical, of well-being, allowing a person to do basic things, to live like a, and a uh, live like a civil human being, to realize their own abilities, and that's what you all are doing here through SAMHSA, realizing your own abilities. Cope with normal stress in life. You know about that too because you got to cook down, you got to get the baby, and you got to work on your dissertation. And if you can't pull those things together, then you're asking for an extension. <laughs> <laughs> and then you have to work productively. And you have to work productively according to your husband, your child, your department chair, the dean and your neighbor and everybody else. Everybody is saying how you need to work productively. And that's all a part of mental health and also it's a part of knowing when to say, no, I can't do anymore. And then you have to contribute to your community because that's humanity and that's ability. When you can contribute to your community and go beyond yourself, that's humanity. I move on to chapter 13 in the book that's written by uh, Dr. Derek Griffith, who's at Georgetown University. He was formerly at uh, Vanderbilt, and he writes about race, ethnicity, and population health. And he asked the question, should we use race and ethnicity in population health research? You have to read the chapter to get the whole context. And he talks about how the concept of the word Caucasian came about. I don't have time to tell you, but uh, he suggests that we don't use it because it has no scientific evidence. When you read the book, you say, well, how in the world did this happen? <laughs> so what he talks about is a multidimensional nature of a person's identity. They are biopsychal social factors. Uh, race should be used when the aim of the research is to explore how racial stratification influences health. We all know about that. It all affects us, our research, and our own personal lives and our family. We know that. Ethnicity should be used, he suggests, to explore how aspects of social life and personal identity affect health. And to understand how social stratification and exposure to stress, reclaim, or discrimination may vary by ethnicity, and I would add by race. And of course, this notion here is about uh, equity as well. Now, uh, a fellow, uh, Dr. Hampton, from she's a graduate of University of California, San Francisco. I called her up and I said, I'm doing a book and I would like you to write about uh, vulnerabilities. And she sent me this chapter that had the eight pillows uh, from CAST, and I called her up. And I said, this is brilliant. This is creative. 
thank you. Now you got to do another section over. <laughs> and she said, okay. But she wrote a brilliant chapter using the eight pillows of case of cast. And I said to her, I said, you know, Dr. Hampson, I never would have thought about that. And I don't think I would have. Now, the eight pillows, and I think you've read the book. How many of you read the book? You mean, um, yeah, cast? Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's a brilliant book. It's a, brilliant These, book. it's a brilliant book. You need to read it. And you can even get it on audio if you don't have time to read it while you're cooking. Mm -hmm. Read it while you are uh, vacuuming, uh, doing other kind, taking your children to soccer, doing other things. Uh, she talks about the divine will and the law of nature, which speaks against people of color. Read the chapter. Their superiority. So some are worthy and others are not worthy. I'll let you decide who's worthy and who's not worthy. And if you can't figure that one out, I won't tell Miss Jackson. <laughs> she talks about heredity. Who do you marry? Who do you transfer the wealth to? Who do you stay away from? She talks about ways to control marriage so that the money won't get out of the system. And those people, I had a patient who told me that if you marry somebody out of, the, out of your social group, then you're getting somebody out the woodpile. And I said, what does that mean? He says, just trash. That's, what it, that's in the woodpile. OK? So you have to be careful uh, about that. She talked about the purity versus uh, pollution. And if you come from the woodpile, you're polluted. Occupational hierarchy. Who gets the opportunity to go to school, to go to medical school, to go to nursing school? Who gets a chance in our universities to go to do study abroad, etc., etc.? And it goes on and on. Uh, the the dehumanization that comes about because of stigma. And this book is not about mental illness. It's about how you look and how you sound and how you talk, how I look, how I sound, and how I talk, and also where I live and what my history is. If you've been a slave or the descendant of a slave, can you ever be free? We have to free ourselves. If we wait for others to free us, we will always be in bondage. The next one is chapter 17, written by a group of social workers. Uh, and this is about rural health. One slide. In the United States, about 15% of people live in rural America, and most of them are white. Very few black people other people of color live in rural communities except to work, except to pick the cotton, etc., etc. Eighty-five live in urban America. Throughout the world, about 50% live in urban and 50% live in rural. Now, the shift across the world community is that if you live in an urban community, you are more likely to have more opportunity. So what are these opportunities? There's income growth, more jobs, education achievement. Here, just in Washington, D.C., in this greater metropolitan area, there are five or six universities. In Cleveland, there are five or six universities. But there are none in rural America. And then you have uh, mass media and connections, availability for health systems. They're not necessarily in rural America. Large numbers of people that you can interact with, different cultures, different religious practices, different foods, different uh, languages, different ways of thinking, and physical access to goods and services. You're not going to find uh, a food desert necessarily in a vibrant urban community. Now, in the rural area where I live, if you don't have a car you, or your neighbor doesn't have a car, you're in trouble. Higher rates of unhealthy behavior. In the rural area when I grew up, there was uh, uh, 
sniff tobacco chewing, and there was also snuff dipping and also smoking. We called it uh, chew. Red man's chew was the favorite kind of tobacco when I grew up. Less access to health care, few resources for healthy food, an aging population, lower income, less education. But there's also something that binds them all together, and that is with regard to the social determinants of health, we have mortality and morbidity in the areas of motor vehicle accidents, opiate and other drug use, unemployment, and the lack of access to health care. Now in Cleveland, we have people living on block from one of the world's greatest hospitals. But you know the rest of that story. Somebody tell me the rest of that story. I'm sorry? What does that mean? Why not? They're sent away. Why not? Insurance. No insurance and no money. Mm -hmm. And you know what else? No advocacy. Mm -hmm. No advocacy. And you know what else? No health literacy. Mm -hmm. They don't even know how to adequately explain what's wrong and why they should be seen, mm -hmm. even though they can get a visit or two at the uh, emergency department. They don't even know to go. They don't even, the health literary is such that they don't even know that they can go to the emergency department except when pain sets in and riveting in their, in their bodies and in their souls, then they go. I have to tell you a little story. A long time ago in rural Florida, there was a man who needed health care, and he was finished three or four, uh, maybe third grade. He was very obese. He's a kind and good man and a good father. So he complained about health care and he didn't have health care. You know what I told him? Don't tell anybody. You know what I told him? I told his wife. See, I worked at a health science center, so I was a bit informed, uh, a little bit. So I said on early Monday, don't go on Friday nights. Don't go on Saturday nights. It's crowded. Early Monday morning, about 3 o'clock in the morning, take your husband to the emergency room. Mm -hmm. There's less likely to be a long line for triage. And if you come at 3 o'clock in the morning, they're going to think you're sick. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. He got health care. Mm -hmm. And then I'd like to also tell you this. And so after she, he got health care and he got into the system, see, Florida didn't extend Medicaid, OK? So you're just kind of on your own. And so he thought he was being helpful. And he said, well, you know, I got here because Miss Faye told me just what to say. <laughs> <laughs> now I work at the hospital. <laughs> so what I didn't tell him is to keep his mouth shut. <laughs> now, when we talk about historical trauma, it makes me very sad to think about the history of Native Americans and Alaska Natives, and I must add, Hawaiian Natives and Pacific Islanders. All of us have had some kind of uh, trauma. Today we're talking about historical trauma. This chapter was written by Dr. Gary Lance, PhD, who's a graduate of this program, and Chief Nursing Officer for the Choctaw Nation in Oklahoma. We're very proud of you. And this is one slide. The soul wounds of the past and present must heal in order to return the Native people to harmony with the spiritual and physical worlds. Forced assimilation and acculturation have resulted in the devaluation and dismissal of cultural, spiritual practice, and folkways that traditionally serve as positive barriers or protective barriers for Native people's physical and psychological health. The loss of culture has bred a sense of hopelessness that is exacerbated by the demise of the traditional family and the lack of quality health care 
and educational opportunities. Without intervention that are culturally concurrent and sustained, violence, suicide, unemployment, and substance abuse will be self-perpetuating. Self-perpetuating is the key word there. Now, I'd like to also go back about uh, our families and let you know that I was asked to read a dissertation written by a social worker about two years ago. Social worker, not, not at my place, someplace else, and I read the dissertation, and it was about fatherhood. And from that dissertation, I learned that up until about the 1970s, black families had a higher percentage of intact families yes. than white families. Yes. Okay? After the 1970s, things began to erode. Now, that's an intersectionality that some of you all need to investigate. And what happened after the 1970s to erode the black family and the black community? Now, let me tell you what else I wrote about the dis read about the dissertation. She had in her dissertation well documented that about 70% of all black babies born today are born to single women and Medicaid pays the bill. Mm -hmm. Now that's a whole discussion for a whole nother intensive seminar at a different time. But these are critical problems that come on our watch, on our agenda. What happened? And how can we fix it? I think we have to think beyond a doula, the doula for right now, but after that lady goes home, that baby goes home, what are the social determinants that create these situations? That's for you to answer. So for Native Americans and for others, if the soul is wounded, then growth uh, becomes stagnant and developmentally flawed. It's difficult to move forward if your soul is wounded. Mm -hmm. Now, the Minority Fellowship Program has been to a reservation, and I was sent to a reservation by SAMHSA. And I was sitting next to a chief, and any time there's a suicide in the community, the chief has to be notified. That chief was not there 30 minutes before he got a phone call. And he said, I got to go. A 10-year-old child has committed suicide. That's the Native American reservation, the highest suicide rate in the nation. And I always say to my students, they said, oh. I said, please, we have no space for surprise. Mm -hmm. This has been happening mm -hmm. for generations. Mm -hmm. So when you do this, <gasps> I'm going to ask you, how is that you did not know this? Mm -hmm. And now that you do know it, what difference does it make? Mm -hmm. I ask you the same thing. So we move on to chapter 19, written by my colleagues at Duke University. And of course, the person I contacted was uh, Dr. Rosa uh, Gonzalez, who was also a fellow, and she got her colleagues, and they wrote the chapter. Now, this is about redlining. Mm -hmm. Neighborhoods and communities, how did they get structured the way they are now? And what role did structural racism play? Now, structural racism, we talk about it all the time. It's very simple and devastating. The totality of ways in which societies foster racial discrimination through enforcing systems of housing, education, employment, health care, criminal justice, access to colleges and universities, and watch the Supreme Court decision, because we're going to get uh, we're going to get a bombshell about affirmative, not well, about diversity and inclusion. We're going to get a bombshell. It's supposed to come out today. I haven't, haven't gotten a chance to check, but check it out. And you have to ask, why is this happening now? Why is it happening? And what can we do 
to work around it and to continue to be productive. And so racial segregation is associated with adverse health outcomes, increased exposure to air pollution, lead in the paint, lead in the soil, etc., heightened risk of chronic disease, decreased access to health care, high rates of crime and homicide, and incarceration, and redlining. Now let me tell you a little about redlining. Redlining, anybody know about redlining? Can you help me out? You, you know about it? Redlining, anybody? Okay, so you stand up so you can help me out. Help me? Yeah, all of you. All of you know, stand up. I'll start and you stand up and help me out. I'll start. Redlining occurred during the late 1930s and 40s, right during and after World War II. Am I right? Absolutely. Thank you. Glad you said yes. I've been in trouble if you said no. <laughs> and redlining was created by who? Who created redlining? The government. The federal government, including the popular best president the United States had ever had, and that's um, Eisenhower. Eisenhower. Who said Eisenhower? Miss Jackson, somebody, a fellow said Eisenhower. I won't tell, I won't tell. But we say FDR. FDR. Right. Eisenhower. Because we all know. FDR. And let me just tell you this little piece. This is not in my presentation. But FDR could have run for president for a third term. And that's when the United States Congress said, we got to put a cap on this, yes, eight right. years, and that's it. He was a very popular president and did some good things. But he also did some things to keep being president. Right. And so he did some redlining. Yeah. Redlining by the federal government, they had four categories. If it were green, where white people lived, mm -hmm. The banks and nice lawns and good jobs, stable communities, built communities, economic stability back to the social determinants of health, okay? They got high priority for bank loans and they could build lovely houses. Okay, the next category was yellow. Yellow was maybe, but be careful. And then the next category was red. Red. Don't do it. All I can do is give you a warning. And guess what? The bank president and the board of directors said no. And what you have is communities all over the United States that were red lined. I give you one example. This example comes from Decatur, Illinois. Uh, and uh, in our book, we, I have redlining in the chapter, one or two chapters if you, and we have resources. If you click on the resource, you get a live link. It'll take you to your hometown, and you can look at the redlining in your hometown. The other thing it is, it also gave um, the opportunity for governments to carve up communities and split them up. Like a black community or, or a Latino community had become really strong and they decided, oh, we're going to put a highway here and say it was for the benefit of, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah well, now, now that was a little different from redlining. But it was a part of it. was a part it of it. Now, redlining, yeah. now that's redlining where the government says you're not going to get in the money to build a house. Right. Right? The other thing that happened is when the veterans came home, there was a bifurcation the white veterans got this amount of money, and the black veterans got this amount of money. And if you go on and on, and if you go to Cabin John, Maryland, which is about 30 miles from here, you see a community of black veterans, and you look at their little houses. You come to my community, I can take you to Bethune Village, and I can show you the little houses where people have gone and risked their lives. That's the money they got. Uh, now, with the highways, the highways did not happen until after who came, became president? 
Eisenhower. 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 Now let me show you the connection. Eisenhower was a general in the military. Is that right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And when Eisenhower got to Germany, he saw the Audubon. And he was amazed about the Audubon. And he said these huge highways where the Germans could get their vehicles and machineries. And, uh, and when he said, oh my goodness, when I got back to America, we gonna get some of that. <laughs> and he became president. And one of his objectives was to create a system where a person could go from California to Maine to Florida without ever having a traffic light. Mm -hmm. And in order to do that, they destroyed the worthy and the unworthy neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. They went to the unworthy neighborhoods and split right through them. That's how they get the highway system. Yeah. And to this day, there are people before the highways, their cousin live across the street, and they lived here. Now they have to go down the route, they have to go to exit 10 to come back on exit 15 to come back around the corner to get to grandmama's house. Mm -hmm. Tore the neighborhoods up, tore the businesses up without any regard, without any regard for health, for well-being, for education, and for just basic civility. And then that, then it's, it filters down to getting um, like refinancing to help mm -hmm. make help your mm -hmm. you know to improve your house. It makes it if you're in a red line district, you don't. Oh, you never you don't get anything. You're talking about the value of the the more you mortgage, yes, yeah, yeah. 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 the more your appraisal. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, of course, it still goes on today. But now this, the point I want to make to you. Is this is done by laws and policies, mm -hmm. not from the head of Zeus. Mm -hmm. Laws and policies created the communities that you live in. Now, if you take the red line and overlay it with this uh, other uh, data that we have about zip codes and mortality and morbidity, it's almost a perfect fit. Mm -hmm. A good idea for a dissertation. Talk with Dr. Yaronda. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to move on to the next slide. Chapter 20, I wrote this chapter with a, a doctoral student of mine who's now, she's an Egyptian woman and she's at um, Prairie View a &M University. Uh, and she uh, has produced more publications than anybody else in the nursing faculty. So she and I did this chapter together and adverse childhood experiences uh, has taken, we've known it for a long time, but uh, there's been some research out of uh, Kaiser down in California, and I think the man's and Fenty, and they've done a lot of work. I'm sorry? Uh, oh, Valenti. Valenti. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, they've done a lot of work. Now, adverse childhood experiences is uh, specific yet general if there's violence in the home, a person with mental illness in the home an incarcerated person in the home, and abject poverty. There's likely they are classified, and certainly child abuse. And my student did her doctor dissertation on uh, uh, sexual exploitation of children, and those children who were brought to the emergency room. So she and I did child reviews and at a particular hospital. And we found out about 90-some percent of the children who had come to the emergency room because of alleged sexual abuse of black females between the age of 6 and 10. Mm -hmm. We reviewed the records at the hospital. I don't know where they were abused, at the home. But we reviewed the records at the hospital, and we looked at the data that the same nurse, the pediatrician, and some were hospitalized, not all were hospitalized. There were about two, three boys, but mostly were girls. And guess, I have to tell you this, so when you go back home and work with your families and the communities, it's the mama's boyfriend was number one. Yeah, yeah. The stepdaddy was number two. Mm -hmm. The granddaddy was at the bottom of the list, and we had two people who had been abused by strangers. But when we do the teaching, we said, honey, don't talk to strangers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. But mama's boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's all right. We don't we don't mention that. So we have to be truthful if we're going to fix the problem. Yes. And so what are the outcomes? On one side, I have basically the physiological outcomes, and the other is uh, we have drug abuse and alcohol, depression, suicide. We have, I heard the speaker today say we have a new number for suicide, and she didn't think people were going to use it. Well, the number was generated by the federal government. Uh, it's 911, it's the other one is 988. Mm -hmm. And we have to teach people to use either. I say use either one. Just call. Call somebody. And if a child is discharged from a hospital, I said, get the get the head nurse's number. If you can't get anybody else, call her. Don't tell anybody, please. <laughs> <laughs> My friends don't won't appreciate that. <laughs> but I should do it. So if we are going to make life better for people throughout the life course, we got to nip these problems in the bud. We have to go upstream and stop downstream. It's too costly for people's lives. It's too costly for budgets. And we miss too much in between. We miss too much lives, days of actual productivity where people could be working. We're paying them for sick leave. We're paying them for disability when they actually could be working because you remember mental health is to help the person to realize their greatest potential. So that destroys it all. And we, we looked at six-year-olds, and of course there was some data, not in our uh, set, but they had been abused at even a younger age. So always ask about safety and abuse. The elderly get caught in this trap too. And ladies, and men who dress up and look good and make a good public presentation, they get caught up in this too. Now, the other chapter was written by several physicians, OBGYN types at the University of Pittsburgh. And this is the one slide. When you're pregnant, you're vulnerable because physiologically, psychologically changes take place. But health inequity is always also the root of a lot of the mortality and morbidity. Systemic mechanisms, differential organizations of power and resources across all identities as a part of this, unequal allocation of goods and services, and social attention. Social attention. At, at Cleveland, I talked with the nurse and she said for she's been on a board for 30 years and she's not seen any change in mortality and morbidity among the women and the infants. Uh, that's not what I would think about, but unless there is a reallocation of goods and services, then things are not going to go well. Now, uh, the other is barriers to prenatal care among those of lower socioeconomic status, inability to pay for services not seeking care because of no money or because of the lack of health literacy, preeclampsia, which kills black women, Native American women and others, and preterm births. Now I'd like to also let you know that the new CEO at uh, Metro Health is a nurse, and she has something like 35,000 employees, and she said one of the reasons she got so involved in healthcare because she almost died twice mm -hmm. because of preeclampsia. Mm -hmm. Now let's move on to chapter 23, so say the socioeconomic determinants of cancer, where we have smoking. I'll tell you a story while you read this because I'm running out of time. I interviewed a woman in Cleveland, and she was the caregiver of a rich white man. He had cancer. And she was taking him for her radi his radiation every day and other treatment. She developed cancer. Mm -hmm. So what she did is she went and cut her hair off and got a wig early. So when people asked her why she was wearing a wig, she wouldn't have to lie. She said, I just decided this was a cute little style for me. This woman told nobody she had cancer because she did not want to lose her job. Mm -hmm. She took him for his radiation in the morning, and when she got off in the evenings, she went for hers. Mm -hmm. That is diligence. That is the fact about 
her needing to maintain some kind of economic stability in her life. Mm -hmm. And she decided not to tell her children because they had enough burden. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I'm the interviewer and she's telling me all of this information. And I said, we can get some help for you. I don't want anybody to know. And I said, the help is just to tell people what you're doing to maintain yourself, your job, and your family. It is worth being acknowledged. And you can acknowledge it in private until you're able to acknowledge it in prison. Mm -hmm. This is a cancer survivor. And she said she felt awful mm -hmm. every day. Mm -hmm. She felt awful. But she managed to soldier through it. She had a lot of strong, positive health issues here. So I'm going to move on because I asked you to read this. Did you read this? Mm -hmm. OK, so I'll move on. Uh, so we're talking about women in HIV AIDS. And this is, uh, who knows where the kingdom of Eswatini is? <laughs> you can't tell. You can't tell. The kingdom of Eswatini used to be the kingdom of Swaziland. And it's in southern Africa. It's very close to Lesotho, to Zimbabwe, to Zambia. Botswana. Uh, I'm sorry? No, I say Botswana. And Botswana and other countries. But they changed the name about two or three years ago because Swaziland, they said, was a colonial name, and now it says Martini. But what I've done, we wrote a chapter, and there is polygamy. And Eswatini had the highest incidence of HIV AIDS in the world. So for the one slide, what I decided to share with you, how they are fixing their problem mm -hmm. and it's working. I just think we wrote the chapter and it was amazing uh, that they have developed strategies that including testing at every site, at every health site, there's testing. They do targeted texting and the first is index texting for family and partners of a person who tests positive. The other is social network testing which is to test everybody, all of your sexual partners and everybody in the sexual group. See, in Swaziland, a man legitimately and legally can have more than one wife. So when you go to Eswatini, I've been a consultant to the country. In fact, I'm a consultant to the University of Eswatini now. So what we do is we say, uh, stay with your sexual group. And so if somebody in the group test positive than everybody in the sexual group. And the ones that you tipped out with, we ask that you let us know so we can test them too. Okay? And it's working. It's working. Testing is very important. And then we have the community-based door-to-door testing. Get rid of the stigma. We've got to control this illness or stop killing these men, women, and babies. Test wherever people converge. So if you at Eswatini, somebody might walk in here and say, okay, during the break, we're going to test everybody. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have the love test. Couples are encouraged to undergo testing before marriage, before sexual endeavor. Mm -hmm. And it's called the love test. Mm -hmm. And I think that's real cute. <laughs> <laughs> now look what's happened. Uh, between 2009 and 2015, they've had an 80% decrease in children who are infected. See, you have to, thank you. So you have to own the problem before you can fix it. You have to diagnose it. Now, we wouldn't have jobs very long if we did a lot of misdiagnoses. But when we step out the hospital, it's a whole different situation. We were able to kind of do this convoluted talking that means nothing. But in the hospital, we have to be more specific. And hopefully, we can be more specific and upright and honest in other uh, communications. This is the last chapter in the book. And this is Poverty, written by three emergency room physicians, one in Bolivia, one in Nepal, and one in uh, San Juan Quin, California. Now, what I want you to remember here is money can't buy you happiness, but it can make you awfully comfortable while you in your misery. <laughs> <laughs>
the era of European exploitation, according to these authors, should be called the era of exploitation, not exploration, but exploitation. South America, the Caribbean, Asia, Africa, exploited. In 1978, Almeida, where is Almeida located? Almeida is located in Russia. So this conference was in Almeida, Russia in 1978, where the World Health Organization was declaring that there would be health for all, aimed to help all poor countries advance the healthcare systems. That's still a noble goal. We hope we'll get there. Now, the World Bank is very powerful. It gives money all over the world. But it's managed by the United States. And capitalistic policies promote privatized health care. So if I go to Eswatini, I can say I have private insurance. I want a private room, and I want a private doctor. OK? Same as you come here in Washington. Now, if, I'm, if I got Medicaid or no insurance, I'm going to be quiet. I'm not going to say anything. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what happens to poor people. They don't ask questions. Mm -hmm. The little health literacy that they know is not operationalized because they think that they do, are not empowered because we are in a capitalistic system. And they will say, I'm just sometimes the patients say, I'm just so glad I'm here. I can get relieved of my pain. And everything else seems to be put on the back burner, never to be addressed with them again. And when you get the United States money, guess what? Guess who becomes the boss? Who do you think becomes the boss? I didn't hear you. The United States. Do you think people get good health care when it's privatized? Okay, you got the message. Profit-driven medical care looks at the highest return for the least investment. Right. Mm -hmm. That's the way it goes. Right. Mm -hmm. Now, before I leave you, I want to share with you what is the greatest challenge to our health on the face of the earth, and it's climate change. I was home in Florida, and for four days, we had flood warnings. Fields were flooded, roads were closed. We're talking about extreme heat. We're talking about floods. We're talking about uh, what happens when we have rising temperatures, rising sea levels. That's the little circle. And what does that begin? Air pollution, severe weather, extreme heat, increasing allergies that gets a variety of illnesses, respiratory diseases, and we have malnutrition people. If you can't feed your family, you pack up and try to go someplace else so you can get some water and get some food. And where else you go, you might not necessarily be welcomed. And we see that happening all over the world right now. Immigrants and migrants, wherever they are, just the other day there was, unfortunately, a ship sank with human beings on it. Right. And they were just trying to go someplace where they could get some food, some water, a job, and work for a decent housing, and work for better education for their children. So I want you to consider that this is the greatest, greatest threat to humankind is climate change. I think you need to start doing some research about this. Don, your next op-ed and the New York Times is bound to call you. <laughs> and I wish to thank you for caring enough, to learn enough, to do enough to improve the human condition by reducing health disparities for all people in all places and all spaces. I just want to just take another moment uh, to share with you how I chose these slides and these chapters. I, told, I shared this with 
Miss Jackson, so I mean, she, I'll have to ask her to be patient with me. Some years ago, I was in, I was in Brazil, and I ran across. Uh, uh, my friend told me, and I ran across later a National Geographic, and the assignment to this world class photographer was he was going to get 24 opportunities to take 24 pictures in two weeks. And he could go any place he wanted to and decide when he would take the picture. And the story was about him. And he said, all of a sudden, this is life. He just had one chance in life. He had one chance to take the perfect picture. And in life, you have one life to live. He took 24 pictures, and he thought about the ones he missed. But he was grateful for the one he's got. Mm -hmm. So in your life, be grateful for the one that you get. And do the best you can every day. Thank you for your time. Dr. Gary, that was such a rich and wonderful talk with so much great lived experience and also evidence-based information. Uh, Ms. Jackson, do we have enough? Do we have time for? I know we're over time. Uh, I can give up some of my time. It's okay. okay. Cool. Does anybody have any questions for Dr. Gary? Two questions. So Uriah. Dr. Gary, thank you so much. Um, that was that was powerful and inspiring, and yet it was it's so thought provoking. Um, so I come from a state. I come from Florida, and uh, you know, as I listened to you speaking, I thought about Florida. I, you know, issues of diversity, issues of um, equity and inclusion issues of um, um, what can be taught in schools and uh, in our colleges. And, uh, and I, you know, saw this, you know, just a summary that you gave of this really, really powerful book about diversity and, um, you know, racial issues as it relates to mental health. And uh, I wonder how do we get this information in the right hands in a state like Florida, where you know political ideologies and other ideologies impact what is taught in schools, and um, as the right is getting further away from diversity and inclusion issues, how do we get this information in the right hands so that this can be taught and this information can be you know, per perpetuated. Now that's a very uh, important question, and one I wish you hadn't asked me. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll tell you some now and some later, okay? <laughs> but the way uh, I, I'm on the board at Florida a &M University, uh, and we talk about this, and also I'm in communication with my colleagues at the University of Florida just there on Tuesday. Now, if you're going to pass the boards and function as a nurse or physician or social worker, there's some information you're going to have to know. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the defenses. Some information you're going to have to know to be a competent practitioner and to keep your license. The other piece is that there's some things that are time sensitive we're going to have to wait out. And we'll finish that conversation in the hallway. Uh, but uh, I would like to say to you, don't compromise yourself now to the extent that you won't be able to be productive later. There are some things you can do now. You can take evidence-based data about the people you're taking care of, and you can do best practices and stand your ground. 
Because if you go to a court of law, they're going to ask for the best practices. Mm -hmm. And if you're doing the best practices, you are safe and sound. And every professional worth their salt will protect you. Mm -hmm. The other thing is make sure that you have your uh, nurse's uh, practice insurance paid up. <laughs> Do that. The other thing I'd like to tell you, I know Florida well, I know Tampa well. They used to have wonderful, um, uh, predominantly black uh, schools. Middleton High School was a, uh, a star in Florida for years. And now over that way, it's a whole lot of the housing units that you see right on the highway mm -hmm. that has a whole other history there now. But what you need to do is to make sure that you're solid in your knowledge and in your skill sets. That's number one. Number two, in your organization, where are you at uh, Bayfront? I'm at Baker Health Center. Okay. What you need to do is to find somebody who has some power in the institution, who can be, you know, I don't always use, I was at the University of Florida for years, and these two white men never called me their mentor. I was, they never said that. That was a word that was not used. But you know what? One of them would say to me, never despair. You can always see me. That was a heck of a mentor. That person was chair of cardiology, a graduate of Harvard University and Yale. So I knew that he would protect me and he would have my best interest and he would never trip me up. Now there's some people who trip you up and you call them your friends. So I always go to somebody who I don't threaten. I'm telling you my secrets. Mm -hmm. So I knew in the School of Nursing, aside from Dr. Yorande, mm -hmm. I had to be very careful. Mm -hmm. So I didn't have people in the School of Nursing who were looking at the same resources and services that I wanted. That didn't make any sense to me. I went to powerful people and learned to develop powerful relationships with people in the School of Medicine. And I felt very comfortable there. Mm -hmm. They never talked about blackness or whiteness, but they say what you have to do to survive here. Now, at the University of Florida, I got tenure in five years. And after about 20 years, I was promoted to distinguished service professor, which is the highest distinction at the university. And let me tell you how that happened. You have to stick with these relationships. You can't give up. The man who said I must become one was a man who was distinguished professor. And he said, you need to be one too. And I'm going to call Bob and have a conversation with Bob about it. <laughs> Get your materials together. And I became the first person in the School of Nursing to become a distinguished service professor. Had I fooled around with my colleagues in nursing, they never would have thought about it and neither would I. Always go one step up where you can get some protection and some knowledge and make some other networking. Don't go around. And the other thing I need to add, Case Western, I'd like to tell you this little story and I'll shut up. Uh, it was at doing a, a faculty meeting doing Zoom when we were all having our meetings with Zoom. And the provost came on and he said, excuse me, College of Nursing faculty, I hate to do this, but I need to interrupt you. I said, oh my Lord, I wonder if something happened on campus. And then he said, there's a person in your midst who's going to get a very outstanding honor. And he went on and on with these descriptions. I said, and I'm on Zoom now. And everybody else, some people are in a meeting or in a room, others on Zoom. And he finished, and he said, it's Dr. Faye Gary. Uh -huh. And he said, Dr. Gary, are you on Zoom? I was shocked. And you know, you, know, you can always, I'm not an imposter. I just who I am. You know what I said on the microphone? In front of the provost and the president and everybody? You know what I said? Lord have mercy. <laughs> How could this be? And that's exactly what I felt. After all of the trials and tribulations, how could this be? 
And I went on to tell them about I couldn't be in the classroom with white folks. Mm -hmm. And uh, I went on the Greyhound bus to Chicago because <laughs> I couldn't go to the University of Florida. Never touched a black, a white person because we were not allowed in their presence, et cetera, et cetera. And some of my classmates, some of my schoolmates called me and said, Faye, when you were talking, I cried. I had no idea that nursing had been so rude mm -hmm. and so discriminating. And I think we need to let folks know that. Yeah. 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 You need to write the book. Mm -hmm. Write some articles. Yeah. Call Dr. Dons and tell her you want to write an op ed. <laughs> <laughs> and I was told one of the most egregious things that happened to me is I got accepted to a very prestigious school on the East Coast. And I got a letter and I was proud of it. And then they called me. An interview. I got on the two black folks traveled on the Greyhound bus. Yes, they did. Say, get on the Greyhound bus, and I went. I never saw anybody of authority. I don't even know who came. They, they put me in a little room, and they said, I'm here to inform you that we are rescinding your application and your acceptance. You have never been in the school with white nurses. You could not possibly succeed here, and we want to help you. And therefore, we're helping you by withdrawing your application. Wow. I got on the Greyhound bus and I cried all the way home. That's the story of black nurses. I'm not the only one. But you have an opportunity, and you have advocates. You can go to the diversity, the diversity and inclusion. You can go to your dean, and you can go to your chair. But always remember that you are in a privileged space, and learn everything you can. And be sure you learn how to write. Folks think you don't know. Mm -hmm. Folks think you won't succeed. And in an academic unit, and as an administrator in a uh, health system, if you can't write, you will self-sabotage it. Anybody refute that? Nope. Okay. Learn how to write. Go and tell your advisor you need a writing instructor, you need a writing coach at Case Western Reserve, you can send your papers to the writing center, PhDs, and guess who sends their paper to the writing center? <laughs> and when I send them out for reviews, I get good reviews. Because all of the fluffs and all of the other little baby blunders all taken care of. And they're focusing on the content that's well organized and well studied. And that helps you with your tenure and promotion. Mm -hmm that advances that you don't have so many cycles is good the first time. Mm -hmm. And then you can help your church, you can help the Boy Scouts, the Girl Scouts, your fraternity, your sorority. I did a newsletter for my church, all about mental health. Mm -hmm. I had to write a, uh, what do you call it, uh, position paper about why the provost called us. I wrote it, sent it to the writing center, I wrote it to the provost. He said, I don't have an idea what you're talking about, but I'll, I'll incentivize you to do it. That's all I needed. We've had 10 years, of, just celebrated 10 years of success. Any other questions? Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name's Rashida, also from Miami, but I'm Asian, we're all from there. Um, but I'm at the University of Pennsylvania, and I was just wondering, um, as someone who's overcome a lot of adversity, but also did like a lot of amazing work, um, how did you take care of yourself? Mm -hmm. That's a very excellent question. Mm -hmm. Well, I always had people who I know loved me. My granddad had taught me how to read, lived up in the country, lived in the country, my granddad had taught me how to read. So we were told, it's five of us, four girls, all four girls got PhDs. We were told that we were loved, we were protected, there was no nonsense in my house, 
Monday, Friday, you went to school. Saturday, you went to the field. And Sunday, you went to church. Mm -hmm. That's just the way it was. Very structured. So the way I take care of myself, my father would teach me. Sometimes I said, oh, I got to go to some kind of practice. Or I got to go to the church to practice my speech. Or I got to go to church or whatever. My daddy would tell me, he called me Faye Baby. Faye Baby, mm -hmm. God is every place. And when I was in the pig pen, cleaning up the pig pen, he said, do you know God is also in the pig pen? Mm -hmm. yeah. He's every place. Yeah. Wherever you go, yeah. that's what you do. Yeah. And the pig pen, you don't have to go to church to meet God. So I always say prayers and sing little songs to myself. And I was always grateful for the black people and the white people and the brown people and the blue people who treated me as a human being. That's all I ask, that I be treated as a human being. And I felt I could do the rest. That's all you need, to care for yourself. Sing, dance, whatever you do. But believe in yourself and say your prayers. God is every place. Whatever your God is, he's every place. Thank you, Dr. Gary. You're welcome.